welcome to our cardiovascular imaging conference. Um, it's a pleasure having you today, and uh, we have a very interesting topic, as well as a uh, faculty that addresses different areas of myocardial viability. And this topic is, uh, is I think, very germane to cardiology. And uh, if you think about regeneration, if you think about viability, I think this is a an area that uh, over the years has developed. I think you'll see probably less research, but much more clinical applicability of, of the concept. So what we're gonna try to do today is to go over all the various areas that you could look at myocardial viability, uh, be it echocardiography, just looking at structure of the heart, uh, stress testing, uh, nuclear, PET, and MRI and uh, how do we kind of put all this together. So I think you need to know the basis for each. And if you want to highlight probably one area of uh, myocardial viability, and here we're not talking about stunning after an acute ischemic episode. We're talking about chronic ischemic heart disease situations where the myocardium uh, improves after revascularization, be it with PCI or uh, bypass surgery. And uh, this depiction of the figure from a publication by Dr. Rahim Tula, who uh, unfortunately passed away about two years ago or so, uh, was highlighted more than 35 plus years ago. And uh, before that, we did not really think about reversibility of myocardial dysfunction as much as we think about it nowadays. We thought that if you had a, an infarct, if you had an injury, if you had a bad ventricular function, a low EF, that you know those areas would not improve, ventricular function would not improve. And turns out, actually, after this seminal observation and earlier studies were done in the catheterization laboratory, you're looking at post-PVC improvement in ventricular function, you stimulate the heart a little bit with your catheter and look at that, um, give nitroglycerin, many other things. So. These were the early investigations. We're not going to go through this, but we're going to give you some various concepts. So if you want to highlight an individual who put this at the forefront was Dr. Ryan Tula. Many others actually have pioneered this. And you could see this case, uh, an EF in the 30s. It improves after either nitroglycerin or bypass surgery in the 60s or 70s. And this is basically the spectrum of areas, diagnostic modalities that you could use to help you. There are quite a few. Actually, there may be too many of them, but the important thing for us now is to see where does each one of the modalities, from a simple EKG, even a history, to echocardiography, maybe contrast, and that's what I will address. I think nuclear will be addressed by Dr. Almala, including regular radionuclide uptake as well as PET. And uh, we'll talk about CMR, which is, I think, a, a probably the modality that visualizes where the scar is, as opposed to infer it, either metabolically or functionally. I want to highlight this cartoon that is actually one of our publications, early publications, which tells you, and I know we're not depicting dysfunction of the heart here, but if we have ventricular dysfunction particularly in the syndrome that we're talking about here, which is myocardial hibernation or chronic ischemic dysfunction, is that the underlying pathology of the myocardium is quite varied. From almost no disruption at the cellular level to a scar. And this is the big challenge for a clinician is, how do I know that I have a completed scar? And even in the completed scar, you and I know that there is a rim in the subepicardial area that is still has viable muscles, but it may not be thickening, right? So you have this wide gamut of abnormalities at the cellular level. And the challenge for the clinician, for the imager, is to figure out how much of that is so much reversible dysfunction that myocardial function comes back completely to normal versus a, a bit of a futile area where you have completed infarction and, and basically scarring. So the goals of viability is certainly identify patients. I mean, you're trying to improve survival and symptoms in these patients, right? Would benefit from revascularization, 
uh, not as much predicting recovery, but at least try to help, you know, the situation here. And to me, at this stage of the game, knowing that you can have lesser uh, risky interventions. In the past, we had bypass surgery and you had on-pump surgery. So these were the most difficult situations. Nowadays, you have PCI. So you have, you could do multiple PCI procedures and don't think about the risk of the revascularization. And you can also have off-pump surgery. So yes, you could say, well, this is a theoretical discussion. It's not really a theoretical discussion because number three bullet is really important, is should we revascularize this individual or should we forego that and, and think of the other you know, modalities for bad heart failure, which is VAD or transplantation. This is a very important slide. For the fellows, junior faculty, you know, even us, a reminder that these are the indicators of viability. You have many of them. And don't lose sight of the clinical, you know, the clinical uh, areas that are helpful. If somebody has angina, you got viability. Lack of Q waves, actually, we looked at that, and I'll share that with you, is very specific. Not sensitive, but very specific. Hypokinesis as opposed to akinesis. I'm talking about not motion of the endocardium. I'm talking about thickening, meaning that you still have some areas of thickening. It tells you there is viability in that myocardium. may not tell you about complete reversibility, but it tells you there is viability. Contractile reserve, radionuclide uptake, PET mismatch, Inducible ischemia, so I know that while motion gets worse, and so if you have a viable myocardium, you get ischemic, and no or minimal delayed enhancement on MRI. So these are, the, these are the indicators of viability that are important, and this is from early data from Dr. John, who came and visited with us for about a year plus uh, from Seoul. Lack of Q waves and ischemic cardiomyopathy is specific. So you as a clinician, if you're seeing somebody, you know that they have coronary disease. So you need to pair your information with the anatomy, right? So if I have lack of Q waves, I have almost a normal elect electrocardiogram, that tells you a lot as to availability of, or the, the presence of viability. The converse is not true, meaning, if I have Q waves in areas, inferior, anterior, it doesn't imply lack of viability. So lack of Q waves, almost a normal electrocardiogram in the area of dysfunction, in the presence of coronary disease, because it could be a cardiomyopathy and that's not specific, in the presence of severe coronary disease can tell you that you have significant viability. And we've used it actually on some clinical patients where you know, there's an argument with the surgeon that said, listen, <laughs> and indeed it works the vast majority of the time. And you're talking about a specificity of, of you know, the positive predictive value or sensitivity of that, sensi of that uh, viability is 80% or so. Uh, what are other areas that we use? And you know, inotropic stimulation can be used you know, even in the catheterization laboratory in the old days. Right? People used isoprel and dobutamine and exercise and many other things, right? But we use it particularly with echocardiography. Many of these trials were done, and many of them were done here, to look at lower doses of dobutamine as opposed to starting with a very high dose. Why? Because the contractile reserve in these situations is very low. You're not talking about complete normalization of function and then worsening. You're talking about some improvement of that. It may sound paradoxical to you. I said, I have severe coronary disease, flow-limiting lesions, right? And if I give an inotropic agent, how can ventricular function improve, even a little bit? It's very interesting, and these are st some studies are done from here, is there is down-regulation of beta receptors. So it's interesting. It's almost teleologic. The heart is adapting to lower function. So it brings down function. So if you give it some stimulation, it still has some reserve, but not much reserve. Actually, most of what is thought as to what causes this hibernation is repetitive stunning. Meaning, I get ischemic a little bit, I walk around, 
I stress, I do many other things, and I have inherent coronary disease. So you have multiple repeated episodes daily of small ischemia that the heart adapts with lowering function, okay? So that's the basis of doing inotropic stimulation in those situations, okay? And this is an example. You have a completed infarction in one area, quite a bit of contractile reserve in another area. And we looked at, actually, this is from Dr. Afridi, Imran Afridi, who, did, who was pioneering this work with us as a fellow. He's currently in Dallas. Uh, and we're talking many years ago here, is there isn't a single dose of dobutamine that you're going to get the maximal improvement, right? The vast majority are about, you know, 7.5. Actually, if, if you do a combination in your quad screen of baseline, 5, 7.5, or 5, 10 and a maximal dose, you're going to pick up this improvement in function. And it may not be at 5. It may be at 7.5. So you don't know for an individual patient of where the maximal improvement is going to occur. This is a classic slide from that, from that publication in circulation. Is The interesting thing is we looked, and, and we used the to the high dose just to see what really happens. No change in those abnormal segments in almost a third of the time. But more than a third of the time, there was a biphasic response, meaning at lower doses, function improves, and then you get ischemic at a higher dose, right? So this is called the biphasic response, so that's how we labeled it. Um, and that indicative of ischemia, but also indicative that there is some reserve before you get badly ischemic. Sustained improvement it was a paradox to us because, hey, you have a dysfunction that is bad, and you give increasing doses of dobutamine, and you don't get ischemic. So there are two areas for that. It could be either tethered myocardium close to ischemic area, right? Or it could be a previous infarction, but it's not a flow-limiting lesion that you're left with, so you can get sustained improvement. And the other is very no contractile reserve. It's just pure worsening. You start hypokinesis, and you just see the heart worsening the least of the time that's observed. This is the most important one for you. With the butamine echocardiography, this is a specific or it has a good positive predictive value. If I have a biphasic response, my predictivity of viability and improvement in function is more than 70%. Worsening less, no change or improvement, that's what you're going to expect is most of the time you're not going to do that, not going to improve, and this was... so. If you tell me what is the most, if I want to push sensitivity of echocardiography to the most, I'll look for any improvement, right? Biphasic is very specific, so it depends how you read it. If I'm seeing ischemia, I can take it to the bank. Most of the time, more than 80% of the time, you're going to have some recovery of function, some recovery of function. I'm not going to share with you that recovery of function is much more magnified if you stress them again. They had no reserve before. And now, it's not like they don't only get ischemic. The ventricular function improves so much, right, well, under stress situations. What can you do with quantitative? All the others are qualitative. You look at the quad screen and say, oh, yes, there is an improvement. There is worsening, et cetera. You could use strain. And to tell you the truth, as has not taken on like wildfire. People have published on it. Probably among the best publications was from... Uh, Dr. Marwick, when he was at Cleveland Clinic. But this is a quantitative method of looking at thickening, right, and deformation of the heart. And you could see uh, this is the best function is at the base of this heart. And you could see it on the right side that this is the most deformation, the highest strain. All the others, you can get dyskinetic right there. So you could quantitate it. And these are from his data uh, quite a few years ago also. I'm not going to belabor the point. You could quantitate this. And ultimately, if I look, and this is the multivariable analysis of these predictors, still augmentation by wall motion qualitative is very predictive, all right, of recovery of function. I can look at strain rate. Unfortunately, as you know, strain rate has much more, re lesser reproducibility, if you will, more noise in it as opposed to strain, but it is still predictive, okay? And you could say why the odds ratio is 5 versus 0.1 and 0.1. Remember, these are quantitative variables below, right, as opposed to 
a present or absent above, right? Don't be fooled by the number of the odds ratio unless you look at the data of where is that data coming from. Last things are, at least from echocardiography point of view, is few pointers. One, looking at thickness of the heart is still important. If a heart is thinned out, just like you see it here, particularly if it has a lot of reflections, which tells you a much more fibrosis conceivably in this myocardium, the likelihood for recovery function is low. And we did, in the early days, we did a simultaneous study of nuclear and echocardiography. And this is from Dr. Joselia Schweig from uh, Brazil, who I haven't seen for quite a few years now. And uh, so this is simultaneous studies looking at wall motion, right, as well as uh, thickness, and, uh, and what happens, this is in the solid wall thickness. So obviously, if you have no wall motion, akinesis or dyskinesis, the thickness of the myocardium is less. And also, the uptake is less. By, this is rest redistribution value. And this is an important graph for you. Don't look at the ROC curve per se. This is for prediction of function. Look at some of the cutoffs, right? So... If I have uptake by nuclear, and I know Dr. Almar proud talk about it, 60% or more of nuclear, it tells you something about viability. It corresponds to about a six millimeter thickness of this heart. You know, normally, myocardium is nine millimeter and above. And in the older, with hypertension and so many other things, can be 1.2, 1.3, 1.5, 1.7 centimeters, right? So if you have a very thin myocardium, the likelihood of recovery is very low. Now, you're going to hear from Dr. Shah, right, and Dr. Ray Kim, that even some of these very low ones, if they have no LGE uptake, if they have no scar, some of them will improve, right? So I think this is where the power of another modality can help you. So heart may reverse remodel and increase thickness again. But if you look at the total universe of very thin myocardium, the likelihood of that is very low. So you, you can't forget about the total you know, environment of very thin myocardium compared to areas of, of good thickness, okay? So keep that in mind. So this is where obviously you can improve your prediction, contractile reserve as well as thickness. And last is some viability. Uh, regarding perfusion. We're not doing as much perfusion as before. It is similar to tell you to nuclear technique. What's the difference? If you look at contrast, it's not uptaken by the myocardium per se. It goes through the arterial bed as well as the venous bed, right? So this is part of its problems is you're going to have some uptake in the venous bed also. That may not tell you something about viability unless you quantitate how much flow goes into the capillaries and there are ways to quantitate contrast. I don't want to bore you too much of that. But ultimately, this is a comparative study that Dr. Sarah Shimoni, who was with us for two to three years, actually I just saw her at the last meeting, doing very well. Qualitative myocardial contrast, okay, specificity is low. Quantitative, you improve specificity a little bit. It is similar to rest redistribution thallium, which is very sensitive and less specific. Remember, the butamine echo biphasic response is very specific. If I see that, I'm the most comfortable with it. And the butamine echo any improvement, you will drop your specificity for recovery of function. You know, keep those in mind. I know it may be a little complex. And last is diastolic function. I know it is sensitive to pressure, loading pressure. If I see a pattern like this of slow relaxation in a bad ventricle, as opposed to a restrictive pattern, we've done some work even with biopsies, uh, is that recovery function is better. So you'd love to have a slow relaxation adaptive bad heart. Again, with bad ischemic heart disease, with other things that tell you that there is viability as opposed to just a cardiomyopathy. And it relates this deceleration time, which is the longer, the more contractile reserve and the more viability you have. If I have this long deceleration time, right, I have much less 
interstitial fibrosis, better contractile reserve, better EF change after surgery, and less ICU state, better functional status, and less admissions for heart failure or need for transplantation. And this is from Dr. Yonke Young, who is still in Texas, I think, in Corpus Christi. All right, so this is my summary for the portion of echocardiography. Contractile reserve is a good marker of viability. Ischemia induction, so if you stress somebody a little more, tells you that there is viability, right? Particularly, the predictive value is very high if you have a biphasic response. Myocardial thickness can, can help you refine this, right? Knowing that in few instances where there's no late gadolinium enhancement, there's still viability, so the heart must have remodeled. And contrast echo, we use it less. If you're gonna use it qualitatively, uh, I don't think it's as good. You're gonna have a very high sensitivity and the specificity is really rather low, okay? So I'm gonna stop here and ask Dr. Almala to uh, brief us on the areas of nuclear and PET chemoas. Thank you, Dr. Zogby. Can I have the slides up here? Is it podium HDMI? Okay, so I guess I'm good now. Okay, so Dr. Zogby did a great job introducing the concept of viability, but before I go to the nuclear techniques, I'll give you a little bit also more general concepts about viability and when to use it. So as someone who does viability a lot in different in modalities, I see sometimes some patients who may not need viability get clinically referred for viability, and I want to tease out where the gain from viability might be the best among different patient populations. So some patients where viability may not add too much compared to where you get the most of the gain. So for example, if you have a younger patient, most of the time we're going to err on the side of revascularization versus older patients, more often they may benefit from viability given the risk-benefit ratio here. Among patients who have angina, which was emphasized by Dr. Zogby versus those who are asymptomatic, if they have angina, most of the time they're telling you, I have viable myocardium, which is ischemic. Also, patients who have moderate to severe ischemia and other testing, that is your best way to illustrate viability and the need for revascularization. Compared to those who had no evidence of ischemia or have a CTO there, and then you see a defect where you are uns you're uncertain whether it's viable and it's gonna make a difference if you revascularize the patient. A lot of the literature where viability was initially studied was among patients with LVEF less than 40% or sometimes even much lower. However, recently in the literature, we're seeing much more studies where testing viabilities in the overall normal population, which may not add much in that population in terms of outcome. And obviously, if you have a left main coronary disease, you're gonna always err on the revascularization side versus the chronic total occlusion, which we do a lot here, and this is where doing viability will justify the risk of the procedure for you and emphasize that there's a lot of gain from opening that lesion. And obviously, if there are a lot of comorbidities versus no comorbidities, those patients with a lot of comorbidities are the one that the interventionalist or surgeon is usually kind of skeptical about operating on them, and these are the ones that will probably benefit a lot from viability. So you just heard that there are a lot of procedures that are can be done to identify viability. Some of them have been around for many years. Some of them are relatively new. But how do they compare overall in terms of sensitivity and specificity? And this is a classic meta-analysis done many years ago right now. And in this meta-analysis, uh, 
the highest sensitivity test is actually the FTG PET, but in terms of specificity, nothing goes higher than dobutamine echo and this biphasic response in specific because you're documenting that these patients are going to improve with contractility once they got the um, uh, enough blood supply and they still have the contractile reserve for them. We usually do not document that in, in nuclear imaging, and this is what we look at. I'm going to skip this quickly, okay? So for looking for nuclear methods, what do we do? We have two ways to look at it in nuclear in general. Either we look at cell membrane integrity, the myocytes, and this is we can do it with thallium. You can do it with maybe tetraphosphan. You can do it with uh, technetium-99. Or you can do it with looking at metabolism, which is primarily FTG or acetate. So if they are viable on one of them, technically we call them viable. So if you demonstrated cell, me cell metabolism is normal, then we will be calling it viable. All if there is cell membrane integrity, which is normal perfusion, then these cells are usually viable. And I'm not going to go over all of them, but there are in the literature many, many protocols. So if you go in here, you would see our protocols. You go practice in another institution or visit another institution. They're doing viability imaging by nuclear using different protocols. So let's start with the SPECT protocols. This is the one that we are kind of using more often. So if you want, if the anatomy is known and you don't want to do a stress test for different reason, then you can start with thallium, and thallium is the one, the isotope we use because it does have this redistribution phenomena, which might be a problem with stress testing, and we use that characteristic primarily for uh, viability imaging. So when we look here, with the patient will come to the lab, we go ahead and do a rest imaging, uh, rest injection, then the patient wait about 15 minutes, we do stress imaging, sorry, rest imaging, we image them again, so allowing for redistribution to happen, and even could add another 24 hour rescan if you wanna be complete in terms of the full protocol. Now, if you want to do a stress test, you can do it with thallium or you can do it with technetium because these have two different energies. So you can image at 70 kV for thallium and you can image at 140 for technetium. So you can do the same thing, but now you just added the technetium in the middle, which now you know that the technetium images are the stress, the thallium images are the rest, and now you can determine the viability looking at that. And you do it a, you can do a 24-hour rest redistribution. What we do in our lab, if you want to do a stress, we do a stress first. So we start with the thallium, we do the stress, then we go ahead and do a rest imaging. Then we do a redistribution. So when you are reading a stress viability in our lab, you're going to see a stress first. Then you're going to see a resting imaging. Then you're going to see delayed imaging for these patients. So you're going to see kind of three series to indicate whether this patient has viability or not. And this is how the images will look. So this is the stress image. You can clearly see a perfusion defect, especially in the inferior wall. At four hour redistribution, now you see the defect is getting smaller. It's almost closing by. The septum is less, uh, has a smaller defect. And now a 24 hour redistribution, the gain from the 24 hour redistribution may not be that much. However, it might make a difference in patients who have very tight stenosis in there. And as you heard, the, the resting thallium uptake does correlate with the recovery uh, probability in this. So the more uptake, the more the chance of recovery. Now, what is the strength? Well, this is kind of the most adopted tool that people are using, which is thallium. However, we like to use a better energy. Thallium images may not be the best in terms of image quality, and you hear all the time in our lab that we don't like to read them, especially on obese patients. There's a lot of uh, reduced, uh, there is also a lot of um, uh, image, uh, higher radiation exposure to the patient. So we try to use te technetium. And in the country, more often they're using technetium than thallium. Uh, 
Now this is the protocol. So if you're gonna do a rest only, and this is where the main difference between technetium and thallium, you have to give a nitro. So if you're using technetium for viability, you have to give it a, a uh, nitro before your injection because it does not redistribute. So when you inject it, you want it to be as maximally vasodilated first to maximize the uptake by these cells. And you can do it also with stress and then do a high dose, uh, sorry, you start with rest, do a high dose stress and then get your images. But the more different, the most important difference is actually the nitro that it is a must if you are using technetium. Now, there have been some data that correlated between technetium and viability. One of them is coming from this institution where you see here the percent of viable myocardium and in terms of activity, this is done by Habib Da'i and uh, John Mamerian during Dr. Virani's days. And it clearly shows that the viability, the more uptake, the more viable myocardium you have here. Now, this is the importance of nitro, and I want you to emphasize, this is the same study done with or without nitro. You see the defect there, and with nitro, you are able to see that it is viable. So if you've done it without nitro, you might have called this one as non-viable when it is really viable. So with technetium, the importance of nitro, and this is a common board question that people like to ask often. And with the nitro, about 40% of non-viable were of segments, not patient segments, were changed to viable with technetium if you're using it. Now, I know that the STITCH trial has been around for some time. Because the reason I'm bringing it here because the main modalities that were tested in the STITCH trial were dubitamine stress echo and thallium imaging. Now, remember, the one of the most important things about the STITCH trial is that the STITCH trial is not a viability versus no viability study. It is a revascularization versus medical therapy in patients with HFREF or ischemic cardiomyopathy. Some patients had viability, some patients did not have viability. The decision to revascularize was not dependent on the results of this. Yet, there have been some data showing even at few at five years that the, viab the patients with viability imaging did not add difference in terms of outcome in terms of multivariable and multivariable analysis. So the presence of whether you did viability or you didn't do viability it did not add much in the trial. The reason I'm bringing it here because just a few weeks ago there was a publication even of the 10-year results and the 10-year results did not differ from the, the from the six year, five year results, where you, the presence of medical therapy alone did worse compared to revascularization in this patient population, but the added value of viability was limited in this patient population. You can see the curves are across all the time, and also in terms of interaction, whether they determined whether these patients were viable or not, did not add in terms of the um, predictive value of these patients, uh, predictive value for the outcomes of these patients. Now, there have been a lot of discussion why this happened in the STITCH trial. This is not what I want to discuss. I just want to point out one thing, which is the STITCH trial did not use some of the advanced modalities, which could be one of the reasons why we had these results in the STITCH, could be the modalities used. And we know now from data that at least looking at SPECT imaging for viability assessment, thallium imaging may miss some viability in this patient. I'll show you one patient from our practice. We recently had very similar patient in this institution also. So you can see here, this is a patient who appears to have a significant scar on thallium imaging, has been treated with multiple heart failure admissions, and this patient, until we had did a PET on him, and you can see this is three years later, and the patient has significant amount of viability compared to what you saw on thallium imaging. Someone could say, well, this is unequal one, a case report, maybe it's just the way you've done it. So this is a study from the literature looking at very similar. This is the system maybe technetium-based defect which was almost nearly viable on the FDG imaging using PET. And what they reported is that 
Among segments classified as non-viable, about a quarter were noted to be viable using FTG imaging. So maybe if you decline somebody revascularization using thallium imaging, it's about time to call them back and get an FDG pet on them at this time. But that could be because of very low perfusion. It could be because of very multiple things. Because it could be because of the image, uh, the uh, spatial resolution of thallium imaging, the image resolution, the amount of uptake in there. So there are a lot of technical issues that with thallium imaging that we think at this stage probably thallium imaging should not be the first test or the most definitive test to be relied on for viability imaging. So this brings us to the viability by PET, and if you want to learn more about it, Dr. Nagah put in an issue on current opinion of cardiology all about viability with different chapters, looking at uh, echo, nuclear, SPECT, and others. So we reviewed here in this paper the viability by PET, and I'll show you how it works. So viability by PET, before you, when everyone walked into the room, before you had your lunch, your insulin level was very low, and your glucagon was up, so your heart, was really taking free fatty acid. The heart likes free fatty acid. Now, after you had your lunch, your insulin went up. There is a lot of glucose in your blood. Now your heart is utilizing glucose. Until insulin levels start to drop down, it's going to go back to the free fatty acid. So normally, the heart will like free, free fatty acid, but then the ischemic it will switch, the ischemic one, once we start to give them insulin, it will switch to utilize glucose. And this is what we do here, exactly. So we bring a glucose, glucose and we attach to it F18, which is a radioisotope, and then we go ahead and inject it into the myocardium after doing, giving some insulin. When we give that, FDG will go inside and just got stuck in the cell until it allows us to image it while it is there. So the half-life is about 110 minutes, so we have time to go ahead and do the imaging of the alive myocyte. So for the cell to uptake FDG, it has to be alive because it's going to go into the mitochondria and get stuck there. So now I'm imaging metabolism, not just the cell wall membrane. And what you see here, the way we do it is that the patient will come fasting to us. We tell them fast, fast for six hours because we want to know how much glucose they have in there. Then we go ahead, after we do our perfusion imaging, we check their glucose level. Based on that glucose level, we give them either glucose to drink or if their glucose is too high, then we don't give them. And then we just start to inject insulin based on this table. We would like to inject good amount of insulin before we go ahead and inject our FTG. Once we reach about a sugar of 130 to 140, we inject our FTG. So the way the protocol works, we start with our perfusion imaging, whether we're doing a stress test or not. Then we do what we call a glucose manipulation. It could take up to three hours. Then we go ahead and inject our FTG, wait about 60 minutes, and then image them. Now, for fellows who rounded with us and nurses, we're not injecting this much because our machine is an advanced machine, so we have much higher sensitivity. So we're injecting 5 to 10 millicuries compared to if you have, but most of the install base in the country, they need to inject about a much higher dose to be able to get good images. Now, the most important thing, what do we see with the findings? So either we see on the flow, we see a defect, which is matched with the defect on metabolism, and this indicates scar, or we go ahead and see a defect at perfusion which improves with metabolism, so it does have metabolism, and this is what we call mismatch, and this is very much indicative for viability, or we go ahead and see a defect which actually gets worse with metabolism, which could be due to stunning, but also could be due to insulin resistance. So these are the three situations of what we get to see in there. Now, the test is very technically important. So for the nurses and techs in the room, it's very important that we go ahead and not feed the patient after. So once you inject the FTG, you don't want them to get 
unlabeled FTG to compete with your FTG because this is what you see here. Now the FTG stayed in the blood cavity and never made it to the myocardium because this patient was fed. So now you give them the labeled glucose, but also you give them unlabeled glucose, and more of the unlabeled glucose made it to the heart. And also, it's also important to go ahead and give a lot of insulin. So many sites who send me cases to look at them for second opinion, they say FDG imaging doesn't work. And you ask them how they do it, and this is like one illustrative case from the literature. You see a patient with a defect, so you want to do viability to see if it is viable or not. This patient walked in, he had a glucose level, they gave him oral glucose, went up only to 198. They managed to get only 80 units of insulin, and this patient is diabetic. And they injected when the glucose level reached 135, and now when they imaged them, there was just no uptake. Why? Because this patient is insulin resistant. I can tell you from my experience with these diabetics, I have injected 30, 40, my record is 72 units of insulin. So you need to inject insulin to force the FTG to go inside the cell, especially in diabetics. So that's why we need to get them to have their insulin, half of their insulin dose before they come, they take it. And we are aggressive in giving them glucose, sorry, aggressive in giving them insulin. Obviously, we don't want to induce hypoglycemia. So if we want to give more, we give them a lot of glucose to drink. So we are able to inject that many, much glucose. And the data, although it's like most of it is a few years old, it does show that in single center studies that it does cabbage, sorry, uh, pet mismatch does predict outcome in these patients whether you look at it in terms of survival, whether you look at it in terms of exercise capacity or improvement in ejection fraction. And you need about four to five segments that have good amount of mismatch to really see an improvement in the left ventricular ejection fraction. So now there have been also now the new machines which allow you even to go and match the data. So PETAMAR is now coming in the area of assessing viability in some centers where they do a PET and a MAR in the same time, and the images will give you an MRI, give you a PET scan, and then now they are on top of each other fuse, and it will allow you, now you have the two most advanced tests looking at the each, looking at the same time at the same patient, allowing you to determine the outcome. And finally, looking at the PAR trial, which we discussed many times before, but the PAR trial is a viability trial. Patients were randomized to viability versus no viability. And they were allowed to go ahead and uh, to be treated, hopefully according to the viability recommendation by PET. Unfortunately, it was a negative trial in the intention to treat analysis. Why? The reason for that is that because the treating physicians did not abide often in about a third of cases by the recommendation of PET. So now to try to explain it, you go ahead and do on treatment analysis, which was positive. So technically the lesson we learned from this trial is that Yes, from a clinical trial, pure research, it is a negative trial, but if you abide by the recommendation of the viability study being PET or AMAR or Dubitamine Echo, then you probably allow for uh, improvement in patient population. So this is my summary slide. I put in, in the different modalities that we have, and it's obviously availability and cost will determine which test you're gonna be using. But in terms of sensitivity, PET is the most sensitive, ECHO is still the most specific, and there's a lot of data of validation for all the different modalities. Thank you very much. Okay, all right, so next let's move on to uh, the role of CMR 
for assessment of myocardial viability and SCAR. And what I'm going to try to talk to you about is, uh, one is, I think we've touched on this, but again, what is myocardial viability? How does CMR assess viability? Talk a little bit about prediction of functional improvement. And then really, I think the strength is, is going beyond just simply looking at functional improvement. So obviously, I think as we've touched on already, clinical definitions of myocardial viability include some of these. Uh, improvement in contractility after revascularization, improvement in contractile function with low-dose dobutamine, uh, reduced perfusion, wall thickness. But I think the, the real histologic definition of viability is really the presence of living myocytes, and the absence of viability is the absence of living myocytes. And so here's an example of the way that CMR uh, is able to uh, image this. And this is uh, now 20 years old, the classic uh, publication uh, from Ray Kim uh, that was uh, in an animal series initially where the LAD was ligated. And you can see on the left-hand side what the histopathology looks like. And you can see on the right-hand side what the corresponding MRI. And I think what's unique is that MRI not only tells you that there's evidence of infarction here, but it gives you an exact match to what you would see histologically. And as I'll show you in the next 15 minutes, this information, I think, is what gives us information beyond simply presence or absence of viability. Now, in this animal study, the, the correlation between the infarct size by histopathology, which is shown on the x-axis, and the size of the hyperenhancement shown by MRI is very tight. The R value is 0.99. Whether you're imaging one day after the infarct, three days after the infarct, or even two months after the index infarction occurred. Now, how do we do this clinically? So, patient uh, needs a peripheral IV, but this can be as small as a 22 or 24 gauge peripheral IV. Uh, we'll typically put the patient into, into the scanner first, do a set of CINE images, which allow us to look at contractile function, then inject gadolinium contrast, wait about five or 10 minutes, and then perform our delayed enhancement MRI imaging. So really, it's a fairly simple protocol to do. And in fact, in cases where speed is an issue or where patients can't tolerate being in the scanner for the 45 minutes to an hour, we can actually even do an inverse protocol where we inject the gadolinium first, do the CINE imaging, and then do the delayed enhancement so that we can even save that five to 10 minute wait time. So again, also no stress agents are required here. So this uh, viability assessment by CMR is done uh, without the need for any uh, pharmacologic stress. And here's examples in humans. Uh, this is the uh, New England Journal publication from 2000, looking at a series of patients with infarcts in the LED, where you see a hyperenhancement in the anterior wall, somebody with a circ infarct, where you see hyperenhancement in the infralateral wall, and somebody with uh, hyperenhancement uh, in the inferior wall, due to an RCA infarction. And the unique aspect, I think, is we go beyond, again, just presence or absence, but you can actually quantify that in this person, in the anterior wall, it's almost 100% of that segment shows hyperenhancement. Whereas on the uh, patient on the right, the extent of hyperenhancement is, in fact, only about 25% of the wall thickness along the inferior wall. Uh, and very tiny infarcts can also be picked up by MRI as well. This is an example of somebody who had a peak CKMB of only 12, and you can see the area of hyperenhancement corresponding to the RCA uh, territory, which was found to be the infarct-related artery by cath. So I think the advantages are the high spatial resolution. So it's one and a half by one and a half millimeter pixel size. There's a very high contrast between infarct and normal myocardium, again, between the bright area and the black area. It's a contrast to noise ratio of almost 500%. And again, this doesn't require any radiation exposure to do this. Um, so let's uh, move on now. This is the uh, kind of classic study which looked at patients that had coronary artery disease. They were scheduled for revascularization, either PCI or cabbage. They uh, came to get an MRI scan initially to look at CINE imaging as well as delayed enhancement to, to identify the extent of, of hyperenhancement or infarction. And then were brought back later, about three months after their revascularization, to see if the findings on the initial delayed enhancement MRI could predict improvement in contractility after revascularization. So here's an example case. 
And in this patient, you'll notice there is uh, mild to moderate LV dysfunction, and there's regional variation in contractility. When you look at the delayed enhancement MRI, you see that, for example, the anterior wall has a pretty significant uh, infarct, uh, as does the inferior wall, but you notice the septum and the lateral wall really show no hyperenhancement at all. And in this person, uh, after revascularization, the overall ejection fraction improved from 30 to 45 percent. But I think more importantly, when you look at from a region to region segment, for example, that lateral wall, which showed no hyperenhancement at all, you can see goes from, from being almost akinetic now to having a significant improvement in contractility, whereas the anterior wall that showed a lot of hyperenhancement really shows very little or no improvement in contractile function. And so uh, for this uh, publication, when, when segments were classified, again, based on the quartile or quarter of uh, uh, enhancement across the segment, those segments that showed no hyperenhancement at all had a very high likelihood of improvement, over 80% of those improved, whereas I think the real strength is on the right-hand side here, segments with what we call a transmural infarct, more than 75% of the wall thickness, really showed uh, almost no likelihood of improvement in contractility. And then furthermore, I think what was uh, unique about this technique is that if you look at those segments that were the most dysfunctional, those that were akinetic or dyskinetic, not only do the predictive values hold up, but in fact they get stronger. So that for those segments that are akinetic but have no hyperenhancement, over 90% of those segments showed improvement, whereas none of the segments with more than 75% hyperenhancement uh, that were akinetic or dyskinetic showed any improvement in contractility. Uh, and then also on a per patient basis, if you look at the global extent of dysfunctional but viable myocardium, it really came out to be about 25%. That's what corresponded with about a 5% improvement in ejection fraction. So again, we want to look at segmental, but we also want to look at on a patient basis. And so you really need a certain burden of uh, dysfunctional but viable myocardium to be able to manifest to an improvement in ejection fraction over time. Now, this... Uh, type of study that I showed you has also been repeated in patients with acute coronary disease that came in and underwent primary PCI, where what you're really trying to image is myocardial salvage, and that same relationship held true, whereas there's more hyperenhancement in any given segment, the likelihood of improvement uh, uh, goes down. And then I think also for patients that were not revascularization candidates, either non-ischemic cardiomyopathy or patients with ischemic heart disease that had no revascularization options, it, simply medical therapy with beta blockers, uh, the, the likelihood of improvement with medical therapy is also predicted by the amount of hyperenhancement in any given segment. But as would be expected, in segments with no, segments with no hyperenhancement or no infarction or scar, the likelihood of improvement with medical therapy is not as robust as the improvement with revascularization therapy, either in acute or chronic CAD. So, you know, one of the questions that always comes up, so what is the mechanism by which this hyperenhancement occurs that it's able to show you the same findings both in the setting of an acute infarct as well as chronic infarct? And, and if you think about it, there are two very different pathophysiologies, but I think it has to do with the kinetics of gadolinium. So if you have a normal myocardium where you have intact cell membranes, gadolinium is not able to make its way into the myocyte. And as a result, the volume of distribution of gadolinium within normal myocytes or normal myocardium is very little. Now, if you have an acute infarct, what happens is you've got rupture now of the cell membranes. Therefore, gadolinium can now get, make its way into the space that's within the myocyte as well as the extracellular space. And as a result, any given pixel will have more gadolinium and therefore show more hyperenhancement. And then in the setting of a chronic infarct, where all of these myocytes now have been replaced uh, uh, with uh, collagen matrix, there again is uh, a, an increase in extracellular space between all of these collagen, and as a result, there's an increase in gadolinium uptake. And so you're able to see hyperenhancement in both the acute infarct setting as well as a chronic infarct setting. Now let's talk a little bit about some special situations. So one of those, obviously, is patients who have uh, significant wall thinning. And so this was a series we looked at, patients uh, that all had wall thickness of less than five and a half millimeters. Uh, and here's one example patient from this series. And this is somebody who has a uh, thinned out septal wall, 
and on delayed enhancement MRI also has extensive hyperenhancement in that septal wall. So we have extensive wall thinning associated with extensive myocardial scarring. Contrast that to this patient here who also has a thinned out and akinetic to dyskinetic anterior wall and apex, a very large area that's, that's thinned. But when you do the delayed enhancement MRI, you see only a small area of hyperenhancement, suggesting, in fact, that there's limited scar despite the fact that there's wall thinning, as you see here. And so this case, you've got extensive wall thinning, but a limited amount of scarring. And this person, after revascularization, the ejection fraction improved from 30% to 50%. And I think what's most interesting is if you look at that anterior wall and apex, a large area that was thinned out and not contracting, now there's restoration of contractility to this region. And I think what's also interesting is that the wall thickness has gone from four and a half millimeters now back to the normal nine to 10 millimeters. So you've got not only reversal of myocardial dysfunction, but you actually had reversal of wall thinning. And when we looked at this in a series of 200 patients, uh, of which about 50 of them went on to get revascularized, we found, in fact, that, that the presence of limited scar, in other words, less than 50% scarring within the thinned area, was associated with significant improvement in contractile function after revascularization, whereas those patients who had extensive scar in the thinned area did not show any improvement in contractility. And furthermore, that limited scar in thinned areas was also associated, in fact, with reversal of wall thinning, such, such that the wall thickness actually improved significantly after revascularization on follow-up imaging. Um, and then the prevalence in this series uh, was about 18%, so about one in five times that you had this phenomenon where there was thinning of the wall, but yet still very little scar, and therefore uh, an area that we would consider to still have potential for recovery. Now, um, this is some observational data. Uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Almala, I think, uh, pointed out, the STITCH trial, um, you know, since it was really started in 2000, at the time when, when delayed enhancement MRI was, was really just being developed, uh, did not include MRI for viability assessment, nor did it include PET imaging. Uh, and as a result, the, the, uh, the results from STITCH uh, don't apply necessarily, per se, to uh, MRI findings. This is one observational study that was done that was published about a year after the STITCH trial, uh, which, again, with all the caveats of observational imaging, or observational testing uh, suggested that, in fact, uh, when patients were stratified by presence or absence of viability based on MRI uh, and, and whether they got complete revascularization, incomplete revascularization, or medical therapy, uh, observationally at least, there was a relationship that those patients that got medical therapy did not do as well uh, if they had viability compared to patients that got revascularization. Now, uh, I, I think um, the, the, the other major strength of MRI beyond, again, predictional functional improvement is the other things that it can identify. So here's an example of somebody who comes in with an acute MI who has primary PCI of a circumflex, and then when we do MRI imaging on this uh, patient the day, a day later, you see this finding right here. What is this? This is actually indicative of microvascular obstruction. Basically, there's, there's such an extensive infarct with complete destruction of the capillary network uh, and edema in this area that gadolinium contrast is not able to make its way in immediately. Now, the way we identify this or prove this is by doing repeated imaging five, 10 minutes later, and gadolinium will eventually make its way in. Uh, as is shown here, you can see the size of the black area, which is completely surrounded by hyperenhancement, three minutes after gadolinium contrast is much larger than it is after 20 minutes. So ultimately, gadolinium diffuses its way in. But this tells you that this person has evidence of microvascular obstruction. And there's prognostic data that says the presence of microvascular obstruction in a patient with acute MI has uh, important prognostic implications beyond just infarct size alone. And that's shown in this uh, publication in JAK Imaging from a few years ago. Um, another important concept, I think, um, th that I want to make sure we, we touch on, and I think Dr. Zogby talked about this a little bit, which is that the time after revascularization at which you see contractile improvement can be variable. So in the most extreme cases, in patients who have chronic total occlusion, this study looked at 
repeated imaging. So these patients underwent imaging at baseline about five months after revascularization of their CTO, and then also at three months after revascularization of their CTO. What they found was that for those uh, segments that showed more than 75% enhancement, really there's no likelihood of improvement in contractility at any time point. What's interesting is that for segments that are less than 25% enhancement, when the CTO was re revascularized, whoops, that's uh, telling me I'm running out of time here. Okay. So when the CTO was revascularized, within five months, there's improvement in contractile function, as is shown here, by segmental wall thickening. And then when they were brought back at three years late, or at three years, there was further incremental improvement in systolic wall thickening at three years in the, in the segments with minimal uh, infarct. In those segments that showed intermediate amount of infarction, 25 to 75%, they really didn't show any improvement in contractility between baseline and five months. But when they were brought back at three years, those segments then showed further uh, improvement in contractility. So again, the time at which you image may have an important, uh, important predictive value as well. Uh, and I think there's uh, echo data that was done from here that also showed that if you look at uh, contractile reserve in these uh, patients after their revascularization, some of these intermediate segments may not show contractility improvement uh, at rest, but they'll show contractile reserve recruitment. So another important concept, I think, is that, that although we like to think of viability or we like to think of everything as an abrupt dichotomous phenomenon where you have some level at which it doesn't improve and then some level of viability at which you see 100% improvement, the reality is that viability uh, and contractile function improvement is probably a linear phenomenon. So as you have increasing likelihood of improvement, there's going to, or there's, as you have increasing viability, there's increasing likelihood of improvement. Uh, so although we like to come up with dichotomous cutoffs, that's not the way that the physiology itself works, uh, unfortunately. So another important uh, concept is if you look at functional improvement as kind of the standard of truth, there are some limitations to that. One is what all patients don't always achieve complete revascularization. So we can try to control or adjust for that. Uh, sometimes patients will have a recurrent event between the time they undergo the re revascularization and the time they undergo follow-up imaging. Oftentimes, you can have tethering, tethering of regions with extensive scarring that are next to areas of viable myocardium. Uh, you can also have uh, myocardial dysfunction that may not, in fact, be due to coronary hypoperfusion, and that's where the role of ischemia testing, I think, uh, uh, is important. And then, as I, as I touched on already, optimal timing for follow-up imaging. Uh, we don't know what that optimal timing is. And it really probably depends, again, on the amount of uh, uh, you know, structural changes that happen to the myocardium. And so in the setting of chronic total occlusion, it probably takes longer, for example, uh, for complete uh, recovery of function than it does in, in segments that have very little enhancement. Now, let me just leave with the last couple parting thoughts. Uh, one is, um, here's an example of what we call single shot delayed enhancement imaging. So these images are one image per heartbeat. So this can be done very, very fast. Doesn't require breath holding. Doesn't matter if they're having arrhythmia or not. Literally, the amount of time that it takes to uh, acquire these images is the amount of time that it takes for me to play those images. And there's data showing, in fact, that just the single shot technique itself provide you with fairly good diagnostic accuracy in comparison to the standard technique that we use, which requires breath holding. Uh, the other concept that I want to leave you with is that although we like to think of it, is there viability or not, uh, what is the amount of resting viability? Well, that varies not just from patient to patient, but actually from segment to segment. So here I'm showing you at the top is an example of a normal volunteer. This is one of the cardiology fellows that... Uh, agreed to get put into the scanner. And, and I went through and actually traced out planimeter the endocardial border and planimeter the, end, the epicardial border, and then just open this up. And what you'll notice is that the amount of black viable myocardium varies as I go across the circumference of the myocardium. This arrow here points to the inferior wall. And so if I showed you this right here, the reality is there can be anywhere from 30 to 50% variability in the thickness and therefore the amount of viability within any given area of the myocardium within the same patient. Now, here's a patient who had a non-STEMI, and you can see by delayed enhancement MRI 
I think all of us would say, yes, I see an area in the inferior wall where there's a small area of hyperenhancement. If I just simply look at viability, again, if I just planimeter the epicardial and endocardial borders of viable myocardium, you can't really tell where the infarct is because, again, it can hide between the normal viability that occurs. And so that's where I think the strength of being able to image both the viable myocardium, which is black, as well as the infarcted or scarred myocardium, which appears bright, allows you to get a lot more information than if we're just imaging simply viability or just imaging simply infarction. And we have a couple more lectures coming up later uh, in the series where we'll talk just about that is the use of MRI scar imaging beyond ischemic heart disease, not what we traditionally think about viability imaging, but rather because of the high resolution and the ability to directly visualize myocardial scar, we can actually use this in a variety of non-ischemic cardiomyopathies as well. So lastly, a uh, couple of things to keep in mind is that gadolinium contrast is required to do viability imaging. So ferroheme, we use ferromoxetol quite a bit for vascular imaging, but it cannot be done to, uh, or cannot be utilized for viability imaging or scar imaging by CMR. So we have some of the limitations with gadolinium contrast administration. Now, if you look at the, the current uh, second generation gadolinium contrast agents, the macrocyclic, they don't have an absolute contraindication to renal failure, but there still is a relative contraindication to GFR less than 30. If you have patients with pacemakers or defibrillators, uh, they can undergo MRI imaging, but especially with defibrillators, you need to make sure you utilize a specialized uh, broadband pulse sequence because you can get uh, uh, imaging artifacts from the metal otherwise. And then by the ICDs, where there's a large metallic burn, it can be problematic. And then obviously, you know, we get asked this question every so often. Yes, if you have a balloon pump, you cannot get an MRI scanner. If you have an LVAD, you cannot get an MRI scanner. And so those are cases, obviously, where MRI uh, is not an option. So I think to wrap up, I think what's unique about MRI is the ability to image both the viable as well as a non-viable scarred myocardium, uh, able to be done without a stress agent or without the need for ionizing radiation. Uh, data now over the last 20 years, since this technique has been uh, developed, that shows that it can predict improvement in contractile function both in chronic CAD, acute CAD, as well as, in fact, in patients with heart failure undergoing medical therapy. Uh, and then I think a unique aspect of MRI uh, was it's able to identify this phenomenon of reversible myocardial thinning. So thank you for your attention. And uh, maybe if we have a couple of minutes, uh, Bill and Mawaz, if you want to come up, if there's any questions from the audience, or if... Uh, We've overshadowed everyone. The, the insulin effect is kicking in now. Yeah, to use a microphone. I'm just wondering if you look at extracellular volume distribution with yeah. MR, or do yeah. you quantify that as well? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, so we do that, do that in, in certain cases. Now, obviously, if the question is purely viability assessment, the delayed enhancement MRI technique is the strongest for identifying the presence or absence of, of viable myocytes. Uh, and really for, for identifying scar or infarction, where we, we're finding that the ECV extracellular volume mapping is probably the most useful is in cardiomyopathies. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And remember, the clinically meaningful one, you have to marry this with coronary anatomy and physiology, too. So we, <clears throat> you have to, you know, yes, ventricular function, SCAR, whatever uptake, have prognostic data, but from a management of patients with ischemic heart disease, I think you're going to have to marry those. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. It looks Thank like it's good. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.